Welcome to the program, Advancing Multiple Sclerosis Treatment and Outcomes, Navigating Access, Adherence, and Site of Care Obstacles. This program is supported by an educational grant from Genentech and provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HMP company. My name is Jeff Dunn. I am Vice President of Pharmacy for Magellan Rx Management in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm joined today by Dr. Clyde Markowitz, who is Associate Professor of Neurology, Director at Multiple Sclerosis Center, Department of Neurology, Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The learning objectives for today's program are to quantify the social, clinical, and economic burden of MS and its impact on planned populations, to evaluate current and newer disease-modifying therapies in terms of pharmacology, safety and efficacy data, indications, route of administration, cost evaluations, dosing frequency, and adherence, to identify and overcome access, adherence, and site of care issues that hinder optimal MS treatment, and finally, to integrate recently approved DMTs, their guidelines, updates, and clinical pharmacoeconomic data into value-based benefit design and formulary discussions. Let's begin with some managed care aspects of multiple sclerosis. MS requires lifelong uh, dynamic treatment due to its progressive nature, and it places a substantial economic burden on individuals, the healthcare system, and society in general. The costs associated with providing benefits for MS therapy are growing rapidly. This is largely driven by drug costs. Employers are also increasingly aware of the costs associated with MS, and they're asking us, payers, to advise on the most appropriate and cost-effective ways to manage MS. Payers have been asking for population-based solutions, guidelines, and treatment algorithms for the management of MS uh, that can be used in clinical and formulary management decision making in the context of an evolving therapeutic landscape. Uh, this includes new drugs and uh, some potentially future generic drugs. The cost burden of multiple sclerosis is significant. Uh, some statistics include uh, there are approximately 1 million patients uh, in the United States with MS. The total lifetime cost per patient, and this is per patient, with MS is estimated to be over $4 million. Uh, that's a huge number. Uh, the cost of care uh, increases with increasing disability. So those uh, that are considered to have mild to moderate disability cost approximately $30,000 uh, per year. Those with moderate disability, uh, the cost increases to about $50,000 per year. And then those who have severe disability uh, is defined as having, uh, or defined as being confined to a wheelchair or bed or chair uh, the cost is, uh, for them is over $100,000 per year. Now, interestingly, uh, the, the the drugs account for almost 70% of the total cost of MS. And I would say, and this data comes from 2016, I would say it's actually now probably more than uh, 69%. But this stresses the importance on appropriate drug management. And unfortunately, it shifts a lot of the discussion to managing the drugs themselves and not managing the disease state. So we need to remember to focus on the progressive nature of the disease, appropriate diagnosis, and managing these patients holistically. There are four types of multiple sclerosis. See here on the left, uh, the classifications of MS are uh, progressive relapsing MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and relapsing remitting uh, MS. Uh, historically, uh, all of the drugs have been indicated to treat relapsing remitting MS, but uh, fortunately now we have three drugs, uh, two very recently approved uh, for progressive MS. And then we can see here on the right, uh, the graph illustrates the chronic progressive nature of multiple sclerosis. The major outcomes in MS uh, include uh, approaches to decrease relapses, uh, that's one of the main objectives of uh, using the DMTs. Uh, we also need to address the neurological changes, so uh, how we uh, evaluate and potentially avoid, evaluate lesions and potentially avoid new lesions. And then finally, uh, the, the overall objective, and this is harder to show with the, with the DMTs, but is the ultimate uh, goal of therapy is to slow or prevent disability. So again, we can see here uh, a typical course of uh, the progressive nature of MS, where we start with subclinical and move into relapse and remitting and then secondary progressive. And as patients uh, progress, it becomes more and more uh, disabling, and it also becomes more and more difficult to treat these patients. Uh, and typically, uh, as relapses increase and lesions worsen, uh, disability increases until, unfortunately, death. Uh, 
So let's jump into that a little bit. Uh, here, this shows the early treatment with uh, disease-modifying therapy and how it may slow the natural course of MS. And if we do this, it's uh, very cost-effective. So uh, earlier DMT, uh, earlier, er, earlier therapy is associated with a lower and more favorable ICER. And hopefully everybody's familiar with ICER. It stands for incremental cost-effectiveness ratio. Uh, and then DMTs, the use of DMTs versus uh, not using drug uh, is also associated with lower cost. So if that can be broken out into medical costs and direct costs, so we have some numbers here on the right, uh, medical costs and direct costs are lower uh, if we treat patients uh, versus uh, if we do not treat MS patients with a disease-modifying therapy. Uh, plus, this does not factor in the issue of slowing progression. So these are just uh, you know, costs, medical and direct. Um, there's obviously a lot of other things associated with uh, the, the disabling uh, per, uh, nature of multiple sclerosis. Again, uh, there are a lot of therapies now uh, to treat uh, multiple sclerosis. We've come a long way. So there are now uh, 20 distinct uh, disease-modifying therapies, which include uh, a generic. Uh, these 20 drugs cover 11 different mechanisms of action. They are all approved for treating relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis. We have one drug that is approved for PPMS, and like I mentioned, we now have two recently approved drugs for the treatment of SPMS. And uh, there are also uh, other pipeline agents uh, in the, in, in, in generics that are expected in the future. So we're going to have more options, uh, which is a good and bad thing. It's good in terms of potentially continuing to improve efficacy and addressing uh, progression but it also becomes a little bit more difficult to manage these agents. Uh, and if we have, you know, 20 plus agents, the question now becomes which one of these do we choose and how do we match the right drug to the right patient? Uh, but these drugs can be divided into uh, different routes of administration and different formulations. So there are, again, our injectables and orals. We have monoclonal antibodies. We also have a chemotherapy agent that is used, uh, mitoxantrone. Uh, uh, however, it's it's not used now because we've, uh, over the last decade, have seen uh, a lot more effective drugs enter the space. Uh, the key with any of these therapies, though, is to set expectations around uh, relapses, around disability, uh, MRI activity. Uh, we need to use shared decision-making with our members and our patients. Uh, we, we need to make them involved in uh, the treatment decisions. They need to be uh, in, involved from step one on which drugs to choose, uh, when to potentially switch, and uh, how to manage uh, their, their disease. The disease and the associated therapies uh, do present some formulary challenges, though. Uh, the goal uh, when we manage a formulary uh, is to maintain consistency, and hopefully uh, we are aligning uh, our commercial and Medicare and even Medicaid books of business. Uh, another challenge is to uh, minimize or address the regulatory inconsistencies there's a lot of uh, issues going on right now in healthcare, uh, and that can make it uh, a little bit difficult to manage expensive disease states like multiple sclerosis. Uh, again, like I mentioned, uh, the DMDs account for about 95% of the total annual pharmacy cost per patient and almost 70% of the total cost of managing MS, uh, making uh, the challenge to focus on clinical data and not just the cost of the drugs. Uh, further, uh, contractual management of RRMS versus PPMS versus SPMS uh, will become much more complicated uh, because, again, now we have drugs that are treated, that are indicated for these uh, forms of progressive MS and not just uh, RRMS, and so uh, contracts are going to be a little bit more challenging uh, as we talk about different indications because, unfortunately, we still don't contract uh, by indication. We contract on drugs. This slide uh, is uh, one we use all the time. I really like this slide because it kind of is a snapshot of a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, uh, both from payer perspective and employer perspective and health plan perspective, uh, it comes from the Express Scripts uh, 2018 Drug Trend Report, and it breaks out the therapy class and the per member per year spend and then the trend. Uh, so this is uh, 2017 to 2018, and then the different colored bars are generics, brands, uh, and specialty drugs. So multiple sclerosis is the number four uh, most expensive uh, disease state that we have. Uh, it's actually number three in specialty. Diabetes uh, is not really a, a specialty medic, uh, disease state, and it's number two. So uh, historically, MS has, has always been kind of in the top two. Oncology has now passed it in terms of uh, spend uh, for specialty disease states. So uh, fortunately, though, uh, the trend uh, over the last couple of years has been fairly flat. Uh, for the first uh, probably 15 years of, of this century, we saw significant uh, price increases with these drugs, 
and it was driving double-digit uh, year-over-year uh, increases in cost. Uh, that has flattened out a little bit, uh, but it, the, the other take-home here is if you look at the, the size of the bars, uh, multiple sclerosis accounts for about $50 per member per year spend, which what that means is that every for every member that we provide insurance to, 50% uh, of their premium dollars are going to cover multiple sclerosis drugs, even if they do not have multiple sclerosis. That's how big this category is. In summary, uh, the general principles for MS therapy include uh, the concept of treating as soon as possible. Uh, ideally, this occurs at the clinically isolated or CIS uh, uh, syndrome stage. Uh, and what we, as we've seen, early uh, treatment delays progression to clinically definite MS and reduces neurologic damage as measured by MRI. Uh, we should also consider disease activity and prognostic profiles, including things like demographics, clinical MRI. Uh, if these are worrisome, then efficacy is really the key component that we need to be looking at and focusing on rather than cost. Uh, we do need to follow these patients very, very closely. And importantly, we do not need to be afraid or we shouldn't be afraid to switch therapies if somebody is not responding very well. I will now turn uh, the presentation over to Dr. Markowitz. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And there are a number of factors that we look at when we make determinations about how a patient might do in the future, whether or not they're going to have a bad outcome or somebody who might have a fairly mild course. And so the things that we know for sure are African Americans seem to have a poor prognostic factor. If people present at an older age at onset, is actually a worse prognosis as well. And some of the things that are particularly concerning to us is when we see people who are presenting with motor or cerebellar spinal cord syndromes don't do as well as if people who present with sensory complaints or an optic neuritis. And if people don't completely recover from their, their attack, that generally does not have a good prognosis. Other things that we consider are what their MRI scans look like <clears throat> when they're being diagnosed. And if they have a lot of lesions on their brain and or spinal cord, that's also not a good prognosis. And the location of the lesions, whether they're in the brain stem or spinal cord, does not have as good a prognosis as somebody who presents with a couple cerebral lesions. So ultimately, we have to factor all of those pieces on their prognostic factors that we believe are important, take into consideration what some of the drugs that we're going to use to treat MS, and have a conversation with the patient about what they're comfortable with. We call this shared decision making. And out of this, we look at a number of factors, things such as, you know, what is their lifestyle? Are they planning a family in the near future? Are there issues related to tolerability of the medication? Side effect profile. And then what are the risks? What kind of monitoring is involved with a particular treatment? How frequently are they going to have to have blood tests or other tests done? And then, you know, we factor in, like I said, the other aspect of how potent the drug is and what we believe to be the best choice for that individual patient. So we have to make those determinations when we see them for the first time. So we know from many trials we've done to date, the earlier you start treatment, the better the outcome. And we have this with many of the compounds that we've used and tested over the years. And we know that if you start the medications later, you're not going to be able to essentially recover lost ground. So this is really the best strategy of prophylactic treatment, getting it as started early as possible. And we know how the immune system seems to be important in you know, how it responds to the disease course. And it's a little bit more difficult as the disease evolves to be able to have an effect immunologically on altering the course. So we know that once the disease starts taking hold, it's more difficult. You also get damage to the central nervous system that's not gonna recover. So really our, our goal is prevention at this point. Today, in 2019, we now have 20 different compounds that we use to treat multiple sclerosis. We initially started out with the injectable arenas, then we got an intravenous medication, and then a whole host of oral medications have come out. So we now have many options, and we have to be able to think about how to best stratify an individual patient for a specific therapy. So let's go over just some of the early treatments that we had, the first generation disease-modifying treatments, and those were mostly at the level of injectable therapies. Interferon products, and we have many different selections for that, including subcutaneous administration, intramuscular administration. We have frequency issues related to 
uh, three times a week, every other day, and even now once a week and every two weeks. In terms of how the drugs work, we believe that they have a variety of effects on the immune system, particularly in reducing uh, the migration of lymphocytes across the blood-brain barrier to cause damage in the central nervous system. They have the ability to modulate immune responses, making them a little bit less active and maybe even changing the cytokine profile that you see with the different medications. So they all seem to have a benefit with regards to that immune modulatory strategy. Latimer acetate, another injectable therapy, which was originally studied in a daily preparation, and then it more recently had been found to be at a higher dose three times a week regimen, and that seemed to have a benefit as well, and there's pretty similar kinds of effects on immunologic function. Although we didn't see as much of the effect on migration of lymphocytes, we saw more of an effect on the actual cytokine profiles, maybe a shift from Th1 to Th2 in terms of the cytokines that these cells uh, release, and then a variety of other kinds of effects, maybe even on B cells, um, blocking activation states, so a whole host but we don't know exactly how either of these drugs work because they have more diffuse effects on, on immunologic function. In terms of benefit, we know that the medication clearly has shown a benefit with regards to reducing the attack frequency, roughly in about, 30, about a 30% reduction across the board for both the interferons and glutirimer. We know that they can reduce disease activity as seen on MRI scans. And that can be somewhat variable in the 50 to 70% range, and they slow the rate of disability progression. Now, overall, there haven't been any major side effect issues that have come out of this. We do have to monitor blood counts and liver enzyme levels with the interferons, but overall has been very safe. And some of these medications we use pretty much comfortably before people are getting pregnant or trying to get pregnant, and then maybe even in some cases using it during the pregnancy if the if the disease warrants a treatment during pregnancy. We had the first available drug that was a pill in 2010. And Vingolamon was the first drug available. It was tested at higher doses, but found that the um, current dosing of 0.5 milligrams is the approved dose in the United States. And the way it works is that it binds to a receptor called the sphingosine one phosphate receptor. And that receptor, when it is engaged by the, me by the medication, it gets internalized and is no longer present on the surface of the lymphocytes. And why that's important is because that receptor is important for migration of lymphocytes out of the lymph nodes into the blood circulation. So you can imagine that this actually reduces your blood count of lymphocytes, and that's what we see in testing patients. But because it's only a very small percent of your total lymphocyte pool, which is about 2% total in the blood. We don't really see this to be a major problem, but you will notice that the blood count lymphocytes will be decreased. And how that might ultimately be beneficial is that because they're not able to migrate out of the lymph nodes, they may be less likely to migrate into the central nervous system. And there may be a variety of effects that are local within the central nervous system. There's data to suggest that remyelination could be um, enhance with a medication such as this, although it has not been adequately proven in humans, there's some data to suggest that that is the case. In terms of the clinical benefit, we saw roughly about a 50% reduction in clinical attack rates, uh, and that was compared to placebo. They also did a clinical trial compared to one of the interferon products, intramuscular, and again, about a 50% reduction there. So pretty effective um, in terms of its benefit. And there was also a nice effect on MRI, somewhere in the 70 to 80% range in reducing new lesions, as well as slowing the rate of disability progression. So a notch up in terms of its benefit compared to the injectable therapies, but there are a number of safety concerns that have come out of the uh, clinical trials. First of all, the first dose needs to be monitored in the doctor's office, and that looks like having an electrocardiogram before and after the first dose and blood pressure and pulse needs to be monitored on a hourly basis during that time. It can cause some slowing of the heart rate. Um, we don't really see this to be a major problem for young, healthy people, but it is mandated that we have to do this. 
There are some medications that are contraindicated as well if they have effects on cardiovascular. Other things to be concerned about include macular edema, which you see mostly in patients who have diabetes or histories, history of uveitis. But in that setting, it's recommended that patients get a baseline uh, ophthalmologic evaluation. And then the peak of when that macular edema can show up is usually about three or four months on therapy. So we recommend patients have an evaluation at baseline and then a follow-up about three or four months on treatment. And that at any point on treatment with this medication, if they complain of a new vision issue, which can be fairly common in MS related to optic neuritis, we have to be able to distinguish macular edema from optic neuritis. So a very important piece to be aware of. Other things include infections. There have been uh, 20 reported cases of PML with fingolimod. There's also been cases of cryptococcal infections. Herpetic infections have been seen, so patients must have adequate immunity uh, for chickenpox prior to starting the therapy. It's also recommended to avoid live vaccinations and probably a little bit of an issue in patients who have bad asthma. So it can increase airway resistance, and it's recommended that if a patient has a very bad history of asthma, that probably may not be an appropriate treatment for them. But from the standpoint of tolerability of the medication, most patients tolerate it extremely well. Teraflumide was the next available agent. It is dosed essentially 14 milligrams once a day. And what's interesting about it is that it is very similar to a drug. It's a metabolite of a drug used for rheumatoid arthritis called leflunamide. So we have a data, um, a safety data set that we can kind of look at as a longer term um, safety profile for this drug because of its use in rheumatoid arthritis. So the medication, in terms of how it works, it has a variety of effects on immunologic function, but the one that we believe is most important is that it seems to be an effect, a cytostatic effect on rapidly dividing cells. And that includes proliferating lymphocytes. So when T cells get activated, they divide, and this might modulate it to some degree. Not deplete it, but have a cytostatic effect. So when you stop the medication, this will return. What's interesting about it is that it has a very long half-life in the body. And what that means is, is that if a patient is going to change therapies to something else or stop this medication, and you're concerned that this medication is living in their body for a long time, there is an accelerated elimination, elimination protocol that you can use 10 days of cholesterol. You could also use activated charcoal, and that can take the medication out fairly quickly. In terms of its benefit, shown in clinical trials to be um, similar with regards to the efficacy data that you saw with the injectable therapies, uh, about a 30 some odd percent reduction in clinical attacks, up to a 60 to 70 percent reduction in new MRI lesions. So quite beneficial in that regard. The main safety concerns with this are really related to teratogenicity. And that was seen in mostly animal studies, but it is recommended that patients who are gonna consider having a family, both men or women, that the medication be washed out of their system prior to um, attempting pregnancy. So that should be done with the accelerated protocol of either cholesterol or activated charcoal. Other things that we need to monitor include hepatotoxicity issues. So for the first six months, it's recommended that patients have liver enzyme tests. That's a requirement. Um, you don't really see too much in the way of any uh, leukopenia, but occasionally you might see that. The other issues that seem to be somewhat more bothersome to patients is that they can get transient alopecia. Not a huge deal for most patients, but you, they can see more hair on their brushes, more hair in the drain after they take a shower. So it's recommended at this point that patient, patients be aware that this is transient. It seems to recover after about three to six months on treatment. Um, so you just need to let patients know about it. Now we'll move on to the third in the uh, oral agents that got approved, dimethylfumarate. It's administered twice a day. Oral medications are administered on a daily regimen once a day. This one's administered twice a day. And in terms of its mechanism of action, the clear mechanism seems to be that it induces um, some pathways that could be very important. One is uh, the NF-kappa-B, pathway. It inhibits that pathway. 
Another pathway involved is the NRF2 or nuclear related factor E2 pathway, which can get enhanced. And these are important in cellular activity. What we believe is happening here is that there are issues related to uh, cytokine production. It may have antioxidative pathways that get activated. There could be migration pathways that seem to be uh, inhibited to some degree. So another immune modulatory strategy, you don't really see a cell depletion aspect with this, although you can see a suppression of lymphocyte counts that can be concerning, and I'll get into that in a second with regards to safety issues. Efficacy-wise, show very similar effects to what we see with the Golomod in terms of about a 50% reduction in clinical attacks, slowing the rate of disability progression, as well as reducing new lesions in the 70 to 80% range. The main safety issues with this one are going to be tolerability and some concerns for PML. The tolerability aspects are mostly GI related, abdominal pain, nausea, um, even some diarrhea, and other things include flushing. So the the gastrointestinal side effects are usually managed by eating fattier or at least a good meal when they're taking the medication. Um, that seems to reduce the abdominal discomfort. The flushing might be better managed with a medication like a low dose of aspirin. It doesn't cause a huge problem for most patients. The main issue is that they turn red and they may feel like their skin is hot, uh, but usually a baby aspirin is adequate to control that. The safety concern was that there were several cases of PML that have come up taking the medication. And what, one thing that has been present that may help us with our ability to identify who's at greatest risk are issues related to lymphopenia. And it was seen in only maybe 5% of patients in the clinical trials. But we know that if their lymphocyte counts are below, say, six, seven, 800, that might increase their risk for developing PML. So that's something we recommend people monitor on a regular basis, and we do it every three to six months. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the infusible medications. So natalizumab was our first available infusible medication. It got approved in 2004, but after three months, it was pulled off the market because there were a couple of patients who developed PML in the clinical trial. So there's medication was pulled off the market, an analysis of risks and trying to figure out what patients may be at greatest risk, and it was put back on the market in 2006, and it's been on the market since then, but with a black box warning related to PML risk. In terms of its administration, it's a once-a-month intravenous medication. It's very well tolerated. Um, no major issues that have come up other than the PML concern. In terms of its mechanism, it binds to a specific integrin molecule present on your uh, lymphocytes, so the alpha-4 beta-1 integrin molecule, and that basically blocks the migration of lymphocytes through the blood-brain barrier into your tissues. We think that that is its main benefit because if your cells can't get into the central nervous system, they can have a great benefit. And when we looked at the clinical trial data, it probably had the best clinical trial data that we had seen to date, almost a 70% 70 70 reduction in clinical attacks compared to placebo, 42% reduction in disability progression, and very robust effects on MRI scan in the 90% range in terms of preventing new lesions. So clearly a very outstanding therapeutic option, but the biggest issue came out with the PML risk. And to date, there's over 780 confirmed cases of PML, but we've learned a number of things about how to screen patients for their risk. So for one, we learned initially that the main issues were duration of therapy. So if they took the medication more than two years, it seemed the risk seems to go up after that. If they had prior immunosuppressive therapy, that also increased their risk, and that may have increased it by about fourfold. And the immunosuppressive drugs at the time that were looked at were drugs like azathioprine or methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide. We don't know whether or not the newer drugs that we're using increase that risk, but we're not sure. Let's move on to another medication, alemtuzumab. So this medication uh, is administered intravenously for five consecutive days and then the following year for three days. 
And that's all you need to give to this medication. And the way it works is it targets a molecule on your lymphocytes called the CD52 molecule. It's present on your B cells and T cells. It seems to have fairly long lasting effects. What's interesting about it is that the B cells seem to come back within about three to six months. And when they come back, they are unregulated because the T cells are not coming back yet. And more importantly, the numbers overshoot, so you have more B cells than you had prior to starting this therapy. And we believe that this may be a contributor to why people develop some adverse events related to this drug, specifically secondary autoimmune events. In terms of its benefit, the way this medication was tested, it was tested against an active interferon comparator. And they did two trials, one called the CARMS, one called the CARMS2 trial. And for this study, they ended up looking at um, the rate of reduction of attacks, and it was about a 55% reduction. Um, they were able to show a reduction in new MRI lesions. They didn't see a huge benefit with regards to disability progression in the CARMS1 trial, but that was in a very, very early naive group of patients, so there wasn't any movement across the board for any of the patients. In the CARMS2 trial, that study did demonstrate 50% reduction in attacks, 42% reduction in disability progression, um, and again, a pretty robust effect on MRI as well. So we believe that it's a very, very potent drug overall. And what's particularly fascinating about it is how long-lasting the effects have been since you've only given the medication essentially for five days the first year and then three days, and then that's all you know, you're really doing after that. What are some of the safety concerns? So there are infusion reactions, so this has to be administered in the hospital, and they're uh, prophylactically treated with antiviral agents as well. But the biggest issues that have come out has really been the secondary autoimmune events. And as high as 30 to 50% of patients will have some sort of secondary autoimmunity. But the ones that are most common are autoimmune thyroid disease, and that can be Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, easily easy to diagnose and treat. There have been cases of immune thrombocytopenia or ITP. That's more problematic. And even rare cases of anti-glomerular um, basement membrane, good pasture syndrome, things like that. So because of that, the drug got approved. And when it got approved, it was mandated that they have a REMS program that required patients to have blood work and urinalysis done essentially every month, at least after the last infusion for a total of four years. So after your second year of treatment, for the next four years, every month, you're going to have to have blood work and a urinalysis. And because of that, I think that, you know, we're able to screen and look for patients who are going to evolve into some secondary autoimmune events. Uh, but it is somewhat problematic from a day-to-day -day management, although the company is very good about making sure they get um, a team of nurses or uh, phlebotomists to come out to patients' homes or to their workplace to be able to uh, get that done on a regular basis. There's also recently been a concern for some strokes, which have been seen, which we really don't have a good feel yet as to why patients will have that. There may be some effects on um, the vasculature related to the drug, or it could be related to hypertension issues. This is currently under investigation. I'm going to move on to one of the more recent uh, intravenous medications that got approved, ocrelizumab. So this one is administered intravenously every six months. And this one is a monoclonal antibody that binds to the CD20 molecule, which is present on mature B cells. And we've done clinical trials in both the relapsing remitting population, and that one was tested against an active interferon comparator. And then it was also tested in primary progressive multiple sclerosis against placebo. In terms of its benefit, very robust effects against uh, an active comparator in the uh, relapsing remitting cohort, roughly about a 50% reduction in clinical attacks, 40% reduction in disability progression, and over a 90% reduction in new gadolinium-enhancing lesions, maybe as high as 95%. So very, very robust. When we did it in the primary progressive population, they were able to show a disability progression difference of about 24%, which is, in fact, the first drug that we have tested in primary progressive MS to show a benefit. And it showed also some benefits with regard to walking speed and the 25-foot times walk and uh, quite robust effects on MRI lesions and brain volume as well.
Now, what's interesting about the effect on primary progressive patients is it was seeming to be much more effective in patients who had a history of gadolinium-enhancing lesions coming into the trial. So what made that important to us is that we believe that this drug works in the progressive population, but maybe works even better. And in this case, it looked almost like about a 35% reduction in disability progression in that population. So I think that if you, you know, if you really look at this carefully, you could say that the effect on patients with primary progressive MS is going to be more robust if they still show evidence of new lesions on their MRI scans. That's not to say it won't work in people who don't have new lesions, but at least you can feel a little more comfortable thinking that this is a good drug for that population with active progressive disease. In terms of safety considerations, at this point, we know that there are infusion reactions, and that can be managed with pre-medication, so that's recommended across the board. For any patient who's going to get the infusion, it, it can be slowed down if somebody develops uh, anything more severe. There really was no higher rate of any other big issues. You no know, serious infections seem to be uh, a concern. Maybe there was a slight increase in upper respiratory infections, but no real opportunities opportunistic infections were seen in the clinical trials. Now, one thing that did come out of the studies that was of interest was the issue related to breast cancer. They did see an overrepresentation of breast cancer in the treated group compared to the comparator groups, and that was kind of a little bit of a concern. So the recommendation was that patients should have appropriate screening for age uh, for breast cancer. Now, when that data has been looked at, and they went back to the regions from where these patients came from and looked at what the risk of breast cancer from those regions, it did not seem to be that the, re the rate was any higher than from where those patients came from. But regardless, I think we need a little more information as time goes forward. So we tend to be somewhat conservative and get a sense about how to manage patients. So my, my general recommendation is that people be monitored um, appropriately for age. Now, most recently, really about a week or two ago, we have the approval of two new oral agents. And these are the first agents that have gotten approval for secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. The first one is saponamide. And saponamide is very similar to fingolimide, although it's more selective. It binds to the S1P1 and the S1P5 receptors um, instead of some of the more robust um, effects on other receptors that can have more of a side effect profile issue. So I think overall, it reduces some of the uh, side effect concerns that you see with fingolimod, such as the first dose monitoring issue. So when this drug was approved, it was not mandated that everybody have first dose monitoring. It can be done for a selective group of patients who you are worried about, who may have an abnormal EKG, um, but overall, you will not need to do that. But another thing that they did was they did a dose escalation. That's probably why you don't need to actually do the first dose monitoring because you're doing a lower dose escalation for the first week or so. Now, it has a uh, benefit with regards to slowing the rate of disability progression by 21% in the patients who had secondary progressive disease. The only things to be somewhat... Um, monitored here, like you do very similar monitoring what you do with fingolimod, but for this one, you also need to have a blood test for genetic screening for a liver enzyme genotype called the CYP2, which is basically looking for a subtype of enzyme defect that if a patient is homozygous for a specific genotype, they may not be able to metabolize this drug. So, it might be a contraindication for a small proportion of patients on this treatment, so you wouldn't want to necessarily put them on it. There's another genotype that might require them to have a lower dose, and that's something that we'll learn more about. Another drug that got recently approved is cladribine, and this is oral cladribine. The way this drug works is it's a metabolite of 2CDA, and essentially it inhibits DNA synthesis. It can cause apoptosis, but it has a selective effect on lymphocytes. And it doesn't seem to be a long-term effect on B cells, but seems to be more of a long-term effect on T cells. And the way this one's administered, you're basically doing a couple of courses. So you do five days roughly 
Then you do the next month, another five days. And then the next year, you would do five days followed the next month by another five days. And that's it. And you don't take any more of this medication. So it's a couple of courses over a period of two years. And they were able to show very robust effects on disability progression, on annualized relapse rates, and MRIs. The thing that was interesting is that there was a question of whether or not there was a concern for malignancies. And this is currently not showing up in the extension trial that they have been looking at for the last seven or eight years. So I think overall, I mean, it has an approval for both relapsing disease and secondary progressive disease. We'll have to see going forward whether there are any other issues, but it's brand new on the market. So let's move on to how we define the treatment failure. At this point, there's no specific answer to this question, but the way we deal with it is we look to see if patients are tolerating the medication, they're taking it consistently, and then we look and monitor their clinical clinical outcomes, both from a neurologic standpoint as well as MRI standpoint. And what we recommend people do is you need a good baseline MRI scan. So we know some of these medications may take a good three months before they become active. So we try and get a new baseline MRI scan on them approximately three or six months into their treatment. And then we look to see if there's any evidence clinically with new relapses or new neurologic events. And then we look to see how they're doing on MRI scan. And if somebody has one or tiny little new lesions on an MRI scan, we may not be so concerned that we need to absolutely make a change. But anybody who had a lot of lesions on an MRI, well, that would definitely be a concern. Anybody who has any clinical relapses would be a concern at this point because we know that MRI activity is much more frequent than what you see clinically. So any clinical relapses would be potentially uh, a good reason to consider a switch. And then progression, unfortunately, we don't have a good metric for that. But anybody who's progressing clinically would be a, another reason to make a change in treatment. So in terms of when we make the decision, we have to look at, okay, so now somebody's got breakthrough disease activity, what should we do? And most of us would say you should choose an alternative mechanism of the drug, right? A different dosing scheme, you know, for a specific drug won't, won't necessarily make a huge change. But maybe going to a different mechanism with something at a higher efficacy might make more sense. So, you know, looking at going to one of the infusible agents makes no sense, or even some of the oral agents that are particularly strong that have been shown to have very good safety beta. Should we ever consider stopping therapies for patients? Honestly, my opinion is I don't, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't. There's a clinical trial asking the question after a certain age, and the way this trial set up is 55, no disease activity for the previous five years. Um, maybe you could consider stopping their treatment. Well. I don't know the answer to that at this point. We are doing the trial to address this, but we clearly have patients who have been on medications for many, many years. Maybe they've had no disease activity and clinically, you know, and radiologically, and they're into their 60s and 70s now. You know, it is worthy of a conversation and it's worthy of a clinical trial. So this is what we're trying to figure out at this point. So just to conclude, Whenever we're starting a therapy, we have to consider many factors, patient factors, the drug itself, and what the physician believes the disease course will be for that patient. And when we look at this, we have to be able to see are there other things that you know, contribute to patients' risks for disease worsening, things that are modifiable, managing their hypertension, managing their diabetes, uh, making sure they stop smoking, you know, get them on a regular regimen. Um, and really making sure that they understand how important the therapy is and that they get adequate follow-up. Patients have to buy into the treatment. They have to understand what the benefits are and why we are doing what we're doing. And we have to monitor patients closely and make adjustments based on tolerability and any efficacy issues. So now I will turn the presentation back over to Dr. Dunn to present managed care issues. Uh, that was great. Uh, I now want to talk a little bit about uh, formula management access. Uh, this can be broken down into really three buckets, uh, clinical, economics, and then patient issues. Uh, we tend to focus on the clinical and economics uh, a little bit more uh, than, the, than the patient issues, but in MS and some of these other uh, specialty disease states, we really need to do a better job of focusing on the patient. Uh, clinical typically includes the, the traditional uh, efficacy and safety evaluations. Uh, economics include uh, treatment costs which can include drug costs and then total costs, but this also includes appropriate utilization, so wastage and uh, making uh, compliance and all those kind of things and making sure that the, the drugs are used appropriately. 
and then adherence is also a patient issue. Uh, so we do need to focus uh, some of our programs around uh, patient engagement and adherence. Uh, this also includes, uh, includes administrative things uh, like prior authorizations and other barriers, and so we need to make sure that these things are appropriate uh, because we these, because of the drugs are so expensive. We we don't want to uh, waste money and pay for things that aren't used appropriately. So all of these things need to be integrated, and as we're looking to manage formularies and manage our our care management programs, we do need to uh, look at all of these things holistically and uh, together. Evidence for formative decisions in MS has changed over the years. Challenges include uh, the rapid pace of innovation. We've come a long way in the last decade in terms of uh, new drugs and better efficacy. Uh, there has been a, a historic lack of guidelines. That's something the payers have asked for forever, and we don't have good guidelines. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, their, the definitions um, of outcomes have changed uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. An example is if you look back at uh, the first drugs that were approved for MS, the typical outcome measure was uh, annualized relapse uh, reduction, uh, and now we've moved to other things like uh, no evidence of these, uh, disease activity, and then even the definitions for MS have changed. So that makes it really difficult for us to make indirect comparisons. So uh, b better guidelines and more comparative data would be super helpful. Uh, however, uh, these challenges do provide some opportunities. Uh, these include the potential for improving uh, uh, the, the conduct of evidence synthesis, so doing a better job of, of putting together the, the patient uh, dynamics along with the clinical and the, and the financial that I mentioned. Uh, we, do, we, we can do a better job of engaging stakeholders. Again, this include, it can include risk a lot among the different stakeholders, but also a, a better approach to uh, helping our patients. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, it would be nice to have uh, more comparative data so that we don't uh, have to make uh, some difficult to do indirect comparisons, and then lastly, uh, developing approaches to inform clinical guidelines and research uh, prioritization. The drug costs uh, have led to some barriers to access. Uh, these barriers exist because the cost of treatment administration can vary dramatically by site of care. So channel management and site of care are two very kind of hot topics right now. Uh, so site of care uh, really means that we prefer, in, especially infused drugs, to be administered in certain places that are considered more cost effective than others. So if you look, uh, importantly here at the second bullet, uh, the I think we all know this, but the cost of infusions are typically much, much higher in a hospital outpatient facility, for example, than in a physician's office or home care. So as we address access and patient perspectives, we, we do need to factor in how we are managing our site of care programs. So looking at some examples, uh, Blue Cross, uh, they started its prior authorization policy January 1st for approximately 4,000 patients, and they will only cover infusion services if done at home, at a physician's office, or an outpatient center not owned by a hospital. Uh, another example is Priority Health. Uh, they began uh, its infusion therapy policy last year for approximately 400 patients. So we're going to see more of these programs. We've, we've all been working on them. Uh, some of them have been more options or more direction via uh, care management programs, but now we're starting to see more formal programs uh, that are affecting uh, policies and coverage. Um, the Priority Health Program is uh, similar to the BLUES program, um, and then the Blue Cross, uh, what it does, is it does allow doctors to request exemption uh, from a policy based on medical necessity. So if there are maybe logistical uh, or uh, you know, area issues with, with patients, uh, there are exceptions uh, to the process. But the point of this is to, we, we, we don't want to pay for drugs uh, or more for a drug, the same drug, just because it's administered in a different setting. Uh, that doesn't seem to make a, a whole lot of sense to me. So if we look a little bit more at the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield program, uh, in that, that service uh, became effective uh, April 1st of last year, or 2018. Uh, insurance companies, though, uh, are developing uh, policies that can limit uh, side of care options or require medical necessity and uh, place of service review. So historically, when we've done a prior authorization, it really is around the criteria of the drug. Now some of these policies that we're seeing include not only uh, the questions around the appropriateness for the drug, but also mandating where the drug is administered. Uh, and then uh, looking at the last bullet here, this is an important one. Insurance companies uh, are working to help their members with uh, complex medical conditions like MS uh, to get the care they need in the most cost-effective way. So this is not just drug cost anymore but it includes a lot of other uh, cost components. 
so the, the summary or the take home is we need to find good ways to address costs and uh, the misalignment incentives and align those incentives. Uh, but we can we have to do this uh, while not negatively impacting patient access to appropriate therapy. The AAN uh, published updated guidelines in 2018. Uh, their recommendations included uh, patient engagement strategies and individualization of treatment. Uh, this is uh, hard to do when we're talking about a population-based formulary, but it's an, an important component of MS. Uh, the recommendations also included a focus on monitoring of adherence and disease comorbidities. Uh, DMT should be started in people with a single clinical demyelinating event and two or more brain lesions characteristic of MS. This, again, is called CIS, so starting early. On uh, patients with highly active MS, uh, they recommend uh, three drugs be prescribed, uh, alentuzumab, fingolimod, and natalizumab. Uh, these typically are not formulary first-line therapies, though, so we have to be uh, we, ha we need appropriate PA policies, and we need policies that uh, do a better job of identifying uh, active or quote-unquote hot MS patients so that we can uh, move to these uh, traditionally later-line therapies uh, that are very effective. Uh, they also recommend that uh, switching uh, be done where breakthrough disease occurs or if the patient is experiencing side effects or a complication with a specific drug. And then they also recommend uh, risk counseling uh, with the drug. Uh, patients with MS who uh, initiated uh, DMT treatment uh, were evaluated by the MS Coalition uh, to examine the association between DMT adherence and the likelihood of patients experiencing a severe relapse. Uh, adherence measures here included treatment gaps and medication possession ratios, and they were evaluated for 24 months following treatment initiation with a self-injectable therapy. Uh, this um, report showed that patients with gaps in treatment of 90 days or greater had an increased risk of severe relapse relative to patients with gaps of 0 to 10 days, and that was statistically significant. Uh, secondarily, we saw that non-adherent patients with uh, NPR less than 80% were twice as likely to have experienced a severe relapse compared with adherent patients. So the report found that uh, the relationships between measures of adherence and severe MS relapses are associative and not necessarily uh, causal but it is clear uh, that poor adherence worsens outcomes. So adherence needs to be a priority for everybody involved in helping patients that have MS. So managed care recommendations for optimizing MS care include uh, developing action plans that find a good balance between appropriate access to therapies with the need to manage the high cost of these therapies, uh, using evidence-based guideline recommendations as the basis for therapy to individualized care, so again, uh, finding that balance between individualized care and population formularies. Uh, but the, we don't have, like I said, we don't have guidelines. Uh, we've been asking for guidelines for a long time. So we need really uh, better, more granular and specific recommendations based on comparative cost effectiveness. Uh, healthcare providers and payers must work together better uh, to assess new and emerging therapies because a one-size-fits-all therapy cannot be rigidly applied to all patients with MS. And I think fortunately though, uh, most formularies have become more open over the last few years. I think that's a good thing. Uh, payers do need to take into account the impact of their access and coverage policies for drugs on individualized patients and reduce uh, artificial barriers or inappropriate barriers. And then variations in disease, disease type and severity and patient preferences should be taken into consideration uh, in order to truly build a optimal and collaborative strategy for disease management uh, that addresses uh, all aspects of therapy and, again, strikes that balance between efficacy and cost. Uh, to be successful uh, in managing MS, uh, patients uh, need to be ready to begin therapy. We need to prep them. Uh, we need to do a better job of, of uh, educating them around the disease and the progressive nature of the disease and the importance of being compliant on therapy. Uh, patients must believe, though, that their therapies can make a difference. Uh, they have to be willing to make a commitment, and they have to be well-educated or well -educated regarding uh, the disease state and the therapies. So care for people with MS uh, should be a coordinated, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, there's, uh, I, I, I think that we need to be careful on, on how we interact with our patients. Um, it, it's, you know, an MS patient could literally be receiving a call or information from a physician, from a nurse, from a specialty pharmacy, from a payer, uh, and from a care manager. And that can sometimes be frustrating and can be confusing. And so uh, we need to do a better job of coordinating care and uh, providing a, a more of a singular approach to contact, uh, so it's 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 just better information. And personally, I think a payer has an important role in that. Uh, 
uh, we know what these patients are doing. We know what providers are seeing. We know uh, about their other comorbidities, what other medications they're taking. We know if they're being compliant or not based on claims. Uh, so we can really help uh, with this, but whatever we do needs to be fed back to the provider so that they understand what is going on with that particular patient. One specific strategy for improving medication compliance that I would like to focus on is integrated communication channels, uh, multi-provider level communication uh, with patients uh, regarding the importance of medication compliance really involves the physician, the pharmacist, the nurse, and the care manager. And uh, providers, uh, in, in, in the course of communicating with patients, we need to communicate respect uh, for the patient and their condition. They need to continually provide rationale for any treatment recommendation. That includes current therapy, past therapy, future therapy. Uh, we need to negotiate a plan and anticipate and address problems proactively. Uh, we need to discuss adherence at every single visit in a non-judgmental way. So, for example, if somebody's struggling with adherence, we can't judge, but we need to find out why they're not adherent and address those issues. And then we need to establish a collaborative process of problem solving. In conclusion, uh, managed care formularies need multiple options to meet individualized patient needs. We can't continue to focus on a handful of preferred drugs. We need to figure out better ways to do that. Uh, current therapies provide multiple options for treatment. That's a great thing, uh, but they're very expensive. Uh, so care sh should be patient-centric and individualized to optimize patient outcomes. And then shared decision-making can help improve patient adherence to DMTs, but the costs of these DMTs need to be addressed. This concludes the presentation. Uh, Dr. Uh, Markowitz, I'm going to direct this first one to you. Uh, so the the comment is around all of the many drug options we have now. Uh, you know, if you look back 10 years, we've come a long way with the number of drug options that we have. How do you choose which agent uh, to use in a particular patient, giving all of the options? So we try and put together um, a assessment of what we believe to be the most efficacious drug for an individual patient and then factor in a variety of uh, factors such as what is the patient's age, what is their lifestyle issues, what are the safety concerns that we may have, what are the comorbidities, etc. And then factor all that in in a discussion with the patient about what makes the most sense for them at this time. I mean clearly we want to be as aggressive as we can but at the same point you know, understanding that there may be some, you know, family planning issues, there may be issues related to side effects or, you know, um, concerns at, at a workplace where somebody may have to take time off from work to get their infusions or whatever. So we try and factor in all of those pieces and come up with what we believe to be the best treatment for that patient. But I would say that we definitely are erring on the side of efficacy, um, knowing that some of the patients disease course might warrant a more aggressive approach, where some people may have a very mild course, and you might be okay with something a little bit milder. Uh, thank you. So that, that kind of segues into uh, another question uh, around uh, course of disease. So the question is, when should we switch patients? Is it one relapse? Is it more complicated than that? Uh, and when, when do we switch? Yeah, so that is a complicated question, and um, I'll say that for the most part, anybody who has a clinic, well, let me say this first. We have to know what drug we're dealing with and when it becomes active. So if it becomes active at a certain point, we'll say three or six months on treatment should be its maximum benefit. If somebody has an attack after that time point, that may be enough for us to have a conversation about a change. If it happens before that time, when the drug has not become fully active yet, then we may be more inclined to just say, let's hang in there a little and see if we can uh, keep them on the treatment and maybe it'll have its benefit at a later time point. The bigger question really comes down to when we monitor patients with imaging studies, when you have uh, an MRI scan that shows some new lesions, again, take into consideration the same ideas about when that drug becomes active. Um, we have to Think about, you know, is one new lesion enough to make a change? Is it, you know, two lesions? Is it an enhancing lesion? And there isn't an absolute with regards to this. We know that any disease activity on an MRI scan would warrant a consideration for a change. Um, but it isn't just an automatic switch. It kind of depends on, you know, a number of factors, both on the imaging parameters as well as on the clinical.
Great, thank you. I'm going to try to squeeze in. I know we're out of time. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and the question is, how should MS patients be care managed? And the reason I want to address this is because I think the payers on the phone have are in a unique position and really should uh, be uh, a lead in this. And you know, th these drugs are very, very expensive, but payers know what uh, MS patients are doing. Uh, we know if they're compliant with their medications, if they're getting their refills. We know what, if they're in the hospital or they're in the ER, uh, what other uh, comorbidities they have. Uh, we can look for drug interaction side effects, those kind of things. And then whenever we see an issue, though, I think the key is uh, looping back uh, to the provider and making sure that we're all on the same page. But we have to be careful on how we intervene with these patients because if the, uh, if the office talks to them, the, you know, we talk to them as a payer, especially pharmacy potentially talks to them, uh, it can be uh, a little confusing. It can also, I think, be a little irritating. So we have to work on coordinating it, but I think the uh, the payer has a unique role in doing that. And I'm just kind of curious, Dr. Markowitz, in, in in a second, you know, do you, uh, yeah, what, how do you want to be, um, how do you want the payers to interact with you, if kind of at all, I guess? I mean, what would be beneficial? Well, I mean, one of the big issues uh, is the amount of, paperwork or time delays in getting approved medication um, and you know the idea that people have to go through step edits to get to a particular drug that we believe is the most effective and the best for an individual patient is just it, it ultimately is going to cost the system and the payer more money because delaying clinical benefits is going to ultimately cause more in the way of you know uh, lost days at work, maybe even hospitalizations, more, you know, treatments, et cetera. So those are generally just not good strategies to take. And, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out individually how a patient may do on a particular treatment for that disease course. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that, you know, we have made these decisions based on what we think makes the most sense. Um, so... Not an easy piece, I must be honest, um, you know, but I think that the step edits just are not necessary at all. Yeah, yeah I agree there needs to be a process uh, to work through that um, better. You know, I will say uh, that we do need to figure out a, a better way to address the prices of these drugs. You know, when they're eighty to $100,000 a year and they've taken a 1,000% price increase in the last decade um, to make this really about total cost of care and not about drug cost and rebates. So, you know, but that's a bigger question on how we how we change that process. But I'd like to thank Dr. Markowitz uh, for your comments. I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. And sorry we ran over a couple minutes, but uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.